for a financial arrangement related to the content of this activity, so nothing to disclose. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, the stages of change model and briefly introducing you to the spirit of motivational interviewing, which is a component of this very effective intervention. So my hope is uh, to, to help folks attending today to, to understand what is the trans-theoretical model of, of, of uh, change or what's called the stages of change model and how you could apply that to your work with uh, patients with substance use disorder. Um, also talk a little bit about where motivational interviewing fits into. Um, so, so how can this be a, a, a a useful tool for working with, with that population, and then go over um, some guiding principles that fall within the spirit of MI, which is sort of the foundational piece of, of this intervention. So um, I'm gonna start with the stages of change first. Uh, why is it Im important that you that you know about this model? Well, it, it actually is an evidence-based model to help you determine where a, a, a person may be at at any point in terms of of their um, likelihood of changing and what they're gonna need from treatment to benefit from it, from it the most. So it's a very effective way of figuring out where is the person sitting in front of me um, and, and how can I work with them most effectively. It is not part of MI. This model often is, is used in tandem with MI, so that's why they kind of go together, um, but it was not developed as part of MI. It is, a, it is a separate model, so you can use it with or without MI. Um, but it, it, it is helpful, and I'm going to show you where MI will fit within the stage. So here is a, a visual representing the stages of change, and it's represented as an upward spiral. Um, what does that mean? Well, you can see that relapse is located um, on, on this circle. So that means that it's really common for, for anyone, whether we're talking about trying to change your diet or your exercise routine, or we're talking about trying to decrease your substance use, um, to fall back into old patterns. So, so relapse is just a, a piece of that. It's a falling back into an old behavior. But every time you fall back into that old behavior and you get back, get back into the swing of, of that, that healthier behavior change, whatever that may be, you bring with you all of that knowledge that you learned the first go around. So that's why you think about it as, as walking up a spiral staircase. Patients don't go backwards. They don't start over from zero. And that's really important um, when talking about the, the process of change with folks, because it's really easy for people to get demoralized and, and to kind of get stuck after that relapse. So to be able to explain, hey, this is just part of learning. This is part of uh, changing any behavior. People who want to lose weight, they usually don't do it all in one shot and keep that weight off forever, right? It's, it's, a, it's a process. So learning to change your relationship with substances is the same thing. So helping to normalize that every change goes through this process. So a couple other things to note, it, it sort of starts, you enter into this system mm -hmm. in relations. So that's before you've decided that you want to change. You have no intention of changing. Then that moves into contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. And when you get to maintenance, that's where you've made the change and you're just, you're, you're holding steady. And, and that's why relapse can fall uh, anywhere after, um, after maintenance. The other thing to know about this model is it's not linear for all patients. So not everybody has to move through every single stage. Um, and oftentimes after a slip or, or a lapse, um, if, if, we can, if we can keep patients motivated, they don't have to start over at pre-contemplation. We can get them right back into action. So they can actually skip several of these stages once they've been through it. So what are you looking for? How, how do you determine where a patient falls in terms of this, this cycle? So um, pre-contemplation, these are folks that are not considering a change in the foreseeable future. Doesn't mean that they don't know that they should change or that they aren't getting pressure from friends or family um, or that they're not experiencing consequences. They're likely experiencing consequences, but they're not in a place for many reasons uh, where they're really considering making that change. So contemplation is where they've decided, okay, I'm ready to change. I'm ready to do, do something about it. I'm considering it happening in the foreseeable future. Preparation is where they're moving into, okay, what are, what's the plan? What's the way that I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna achieve this change? And then action means that they've instituted some meaningful change recently. 
So it doesn't mean it, that they're ready to do it. It means they've already initiated it, um, but they haven't practiced it a lot. And then maintenance is essentially where they're taking that action and they're just practicing it. So they're, they're, they're implementing that in their day-to-day -day life. So how does this um, line up? Once you've determined where a patient may be falling, that helps you to figure out what is it that they need from you? How can you be most effective once you've determined that this is where they are in the stage model? Folks with, uh, who are falling in pre-contemplation, this is usually our hardest patients to work with because um, you know, we see the, the things that need to change. They see the things that need to change, but for many reasons, they're just not at a place where they're ready to take those steps. So you're not gonna use motivational interviewing or motivational enhancement strategies with somebody in pre-contemplation because they're, they're not on the fence. They're very firmly decided, I'm not going to be changing. So what you're going to focus on with that, with that category of patients is really rapport building. Um, you can do things like a decisional balance. That's really a fancy term for a pros and cons list. What is it that, that your use is doing for you? What is it that, that you like about it? What is it that your use isn't doing for you? What is it taking away from your life, right? So having them kind of weigh the pros and cons, but really focusing on the relationship, building trust, building that rapport. You're not gonna apply something like motivational interviewing for anybody that isn't in contemplation. So once they've moved to contemplation, they're on that fence. Part of them wants to change, part of them is, is scared to, or is, is struggling with it, may not have the skills, may not have the confidence to do it. Um, so that's where motivational interviewing really shines is, with, is when patients are firmly in contemplation. Now, once somebody's moved into preparation, they don't need much from us. It's really just helping them to scaffold how can they do this in a, in a reasonable and sane way to set themselves up for success? They don't need any more motivational interviewing. And in fact, we can, we can pull people back um, if they're in preparation and we start doing MI. So we wanna be very thoughtful that we're only using MI for folks that are in contemplation. The same thing with action. Once somebody's gotten to action, they really just need our support to um, support that self-efficacy. Um, maybe, maybe we start introducing some relapse prevention skills. And then the same thing with maintenance. Um, that's where we're going to move into some CBT relapse prevention uh, focused work where we can say, how are you, now that you've achieved this change, how are you going to keep it up? How are you going to maintain it, especially when things get hard, especially when you get triggered? So just to give you a little more detail, when someone's in pre-contemplation, really your goals are to bring awareness to the, to the problem, right? To, to help them really see what the issue is, start thinking about it really beginning to introduce some of uh, the, the parts of, yeah, maybe this isn't really working for me all, all that great. So your main uh, goal is to just listen to their concerns, reflect that back, reflect the emotions that they're experiencing, the frustrations, elicit more information, maybe even talking about past experiences where they've been successful or current strengths, current attitudes, and then, and then communicating that non-judgment acceptance. Once somebody gets to contemplation, our goals is to just keep them talking about change. They're thinking about it, they're ready to do it. We wanna boost their awareness of options and we wanna increase that, that sense that this is really for them, this is really gonna be effective for them. Um, so you wanna, you wanna really look at that ambivalence because like I said, part of them really wants to do it. And another part is maybe struggling, particularly with the confidence that they'll be successful. So you can explore that and reflect that and address any discord. So a quick reframe that can be very helpful for folks that are in contemplation is to pay attention to your language. If you find that you're saying that they're saying something and you hear a yes, but, or you're, you're saying, and you're, Yes, I hear what you're saying, but have you considered X? Try switching that to and instead. That one little shift can make a really big difference for people in contemplation because now you're not arguing with them. You're, you're saying, yes, I hear the, this frustration or I hear this concern that you have. And I'm also aware that you've been really successful in the past at overcoming these types of difficulties, right? You're, you're giving an, an, an addition rather than trying to um, enter into a, an argument. And then also supporting self-efficacy. So really focusing on that hope for change, that they do have solid decision-making ability, they have autonomy, they can be successful. Once somebody's in action, again, we don't really have to do much. We just encourage the progress and maybe help them problem solve if there's any barriers. Um, we don't want them to get, take on too big of a, of a challenge right away to think about how do I take small bite-sized goals 
and be successful in each one of those, those stages while moving towards the big picture goal. And then with relapse, recognizing that this is an opportunity for more learning. It's an opportunity to talk with patients about um, what maybe what warning signs did they miss? Um, what, what was the trigger that, that started this, this lapse? And let's, let's problem solve through that. Don't talk about it as a failure. It is not a step backwards because remember it's a spiral staircase where they're moving up. They're always moving up so they can bring those skills with them. Um, and this is a normal part of change, right? Oftentimes we learn best through um, the, the, the uh, times where we, we take a misstep, where we, where we have a, a happy accident, right? That those are opportunities to really learn. Um, so you can frame that for them rather than have it be framed as, as failure in any way. Okay, so that's the stage of change model. Now let's move into where does MI fit? So we already talked about that MI really belongs, uh, uh, the work of MI really belongs with patients that are in contemplation. So if we've done good work to move somebody from pre-contemplation into contemplation, that's where the MI can really start. Um, obviously, you would need to go in and get additional training in motivational interviewing to apply the entire um, model. But to think about it uh, just as how do you apply the spirit of it to anyone that you're working with who's identified as being in contemplation, I think is, is a helpful thing. And, you, and, and so we're gonna talk about that. So I like this quote because it says, people are generally better persuaded by the reasons which they have themselves discovered than by those which have come to the mind of others. And that's very true. You think about it for yourself. Um, when somebody tells you to do something, you're much less inclined than when you've decided to do something. So that's essentially what MI is set up to do. It's to help people make the decision themselves. So it's a different way of working with somebody. It's not a specific intervention or something that's done to a patient. It's a means of talking with a patient particularly around change, right? So, so talking about the, the pros and cons of it, focusing on why it is that they wanna do it, how it's aligned with their values. It's very collaborative and person-centered and it's considered a form of guiding because what you're doing is eliciting and strengthening their own internal motivation, remember their own reasons that come to their own mind, not something that we are giving to them. Um, and it, and it's, it's a very effective method for, for helping people make all kinds of lifestyle changes as long as they're in that contemplation zone. So they have some ambivalence. We're gonna talk about what ambivalence is here in a second. So why is it such a different approach from, from other interventions or the traditional medical model? Well, it's that collaborative com conversation style that is really geared to pull or evoke what somebody already wants to do. Um, one of the, the main reasons why people don't make a change is because of ambivalence um, and because of lack of confidence. And so MI is really helpful to help people overcome those barriers. Um, it's not necessarily a collection of techniques. It's considered a way of being with patients. So it's very different in terms of that it, it works with the patient or the family instead of at, right? It's not something that is done to them. It's very collaborative. Um, and it can be used for, again, for, for any kind of health change. Um, here's just a, a snippet of, of some of the um, research that if you're interested in, in reading more about that. So what is the spirit of MI? Well, really at its core, it's instead of being frustrated by ambivalence or trying to work against it, really appreciating that this is an opportunity. When I hear ambivalence, I, you're, you're, it's really best to think, oh, they could go this side or they could go this side. So let's have a conversation about that. That's really cool that you have these, these two options because ambivalence really just means of two minds. So it's just feeling two ways about something. And we feel this way all the time, especially around uh, trying to make a change. It doesn't mean that the person lacks motivation. So, so that's, that's often mislabeled um, as ambivalence, but it just means that, that they already have both sides. Part of me really wants this thing, and another part of me is scared of it, or another part of me is struggling with it, right? And that's, that's human. So it's a normal part of the change process, and it's something that we can have a really effective conversation around. Um, and in fact, it's a necessary part of changing any habit. Before anybody decides to make a change, that ambivalence is present, right? Because we just talked about how pre-contemplation, they're not necessarily thinking about it, are wanting to do it. Once they get to contemplation, the hallmark is they have that ambivalence. 
What we want to do um, with using the spirit of MI is to avoid what's called the communication trap. And so that means that you're getting into a discussion with somebody where you're posing them to argue their side of it. Um, so when you try to convince, um, you know, uh, so somehow persuade somebody, you're trying to tell somebody to do something, they will naturally defend the status quo. And so we want to really avoid doing that so that we can have them start talking about change and moving towards change. Um, so, so what we have to do is, is called avoid the writing reflex. So what is that? That's that natural inclination that as helping professionals, we want to fix it. We want to make it better. We want to write it, right? So, so that's our reflex and we have to work really hard against that because the danger is um, if we tell them to do it or how to do it or why they should do it without allowing them to talk about their reasons, just like that, that um, has well quote, it's not going to be as helpful for them. They're, they're less likely to actually move forward when the reasons come from us rather than from themselves. So um, it's, it's a good way of partnering and guiding to avoid the writing reflex um, and trusting that, that if that ambivalence is there, part of them wants to make this change and that's all you have to partner with. Why does this uh, show up so firmly? Well, I think in a lot of um, how we are taught to be helping professionals is to believe that patients just, they don't see the problem, they don't know the problem, they don't know how to fix it, or they just don't care. And so the, the writing reflex is, is set in to really say, well, that's my job to give them insight, knowledge, skills, education. Um, if they only knew, then they would make the change, right? And that's not the case when it comes to somebody who's really in contemplation. Um, so, so we inadvertently end up doing some headbutting with the patient's own ambivalence, which is necessary to make the change. So we're not, we're not helpful when, when that writing reflex comes online. So what happens if, if we, we start to really uh, try to do that, that convincing, that, that persuading, the did you know kind of conversation? Um, patients may do a couple different things. They may change briefly, um, do, you know, because they want to be good patients. They may just listen politely and then just do whatever it is that they're planning to do. They may actually argue with you. So you can tell right away you've stepped into the writing reflex as soon as a patient starts arguing and pushing against what you've said. But at the end of the day, nobody benefits. And unfortunately, the patients blame themselves and we blame them. So we end up saying, well, they're just not ready. They're just not motivated. But in fact, maybe we said or did something that kept them stuck. Um, or even push them further away um, because we we got into that head headbutting situation with with their own ambivalence. So um, really going against the writing reflex is part of that spirit. So within MI, there's several components, right? There's the the spirit, the principles, the process, and then the skills and technique. So if you're applying the spirit, you're really applying the foundation of this of this uh, intervention. And one of the components. It, is you can think of it as the rules, which means resist the writing reflex, understand your patient's motivations, listen to them and empower them. So if you're doing these things, then you're really adhering to the spirit. Um, another component of the spirit can be broken down into uh, the, it's like the rule, the ACE, which means um, providing acceptance, unconditional acceptance, collaborating with the patient and then evoking their own reasons for change. So with acceptance, what does that mean? That means that we accept the person who's in front of us without judgment, with respect and trust. So we're given that no matter where they are, no matter what they're doing, no matter what behaviors they're engaging in, they have absolute worth. That, that you know we consider them to have absolute worth regardless. This amazing thing happens when patients, when people, I would say not just patients, but when people feel accepted they don't feel judged. They don't feel backed into a corner. They truly feel accepted for who they are in this moment. They will naturally start to make positive decisions in the service of their own health. So we could, we could do much less work if we just apply absolute worth to everybody that's sitting in front of us. We just see them for, for who they are, regardless of the behaviors they're engaging in. Um, and we treat them with, with respect um, a lot can a lot can be freed up in that space. 
Another piece of applying acceptance is, is using accurate empathy. So that means striving to really understand their motivations. So what are their reasons to want to change? What are the values that are in their life that they hold dear? And how can you have a conversation where their behaviors match up with their values? And then another piece is supporting their autonomy, acknowledging that no matter how much they're using, what they're using, what they're doing, um, that they are free to make a choice, right? That they have absolute autonomy. Um, and kind of like with that absolute worth, it frees up a space when we say, absolutely, it, it's your call, it's your life. You're the one making these decisions. This amazing thing happens, they stop arguing or pushing against, against us or against the world in general. And they're, they're creates a space where they can go, oh, maybe I, I could make a different decision now that I don't have to argue it. And then lastly, um, with acceptance comes uh, affirmation. So really communicating appreciation for who they are, their strengths and their efforts, no matter how small. And that can make a really big difference, especially um, when people are just starting to entertain making changes, or maybe they're just starting to take small steps towards change. You want to affirm every single step that they take because those are really big steps um, for, for a lot of folks. And, and the more we reinforce that, the more likely it is to keep going. So with acceptance, really your job is to just affirm their capacity, their self-direction, that they have the facility to do it. That's different than a more traditional model, which would say we're telling them what they should do. So we sort of assume that if they're instructed or if they're told, then they'll do it. Um, but, but this is different. Supporting autonomy means that, that we honor them regardless of their use. We accept where they are and that they have the capacity to make a healthy informed decision. With collaboration, um, what you're doing is, is instead of that, that headbutting where you're pushing against the ambivalence, you're dancing with it. You're excited about it. You're exploring all of the different options. So, so being curious really, rather than trying to persuade or convince them to do something. Because remember, if they come up with their own reasons why they should change, um, it's gonna be so much more effective than anything we're gonna say. So our job is to really just develop that partnership that honors their experience and their perspective, rather than requiring them to present a certain way or to sort of accept this, like you're not accepting the consequences of, of, of your actions. You're not seeing the reality for what it is. No, they're, they're likely seeing it, um, but, they, but they may be in, engaged in, in that pushing against you. And so, so you're not having an effective conversation. And then lastly, with evocation, what you're doing here is um, you're trying to evoke those motivations, that, those internal motivations and their awareness that they already have the resources in them, rather than this idea that we have something that they need from us, we have to give them something that they already have. We are evoking that, that, that they have the strengths, the skills, they have a why they want to make this change. Um, and so we can, we can just seek to understand that and then reflect it back to them. So with evocation, we're just trying to enhance that intrinsic motivation refocusing on their goals, their values, rather than assuming that they need knowledge or education or, or a skill, that, that that's not the, the deficit. The deficit is um, that ambivalence is, is, uh, is keeping them stuck. And so we want to help them move through that effectively and really get excited about and, and have some reinforcement around their healthy, positive uh, behavior change. So if you think about the spirit of am I in a nutshell, um, it is the opposite of wrestling. You do not want this. If it feels like this when you're in session with somebody, then, then you're probably engaging in that writing reflex. It should feel like dancing. It should really feel collaborative and that you're moving in alignment and, it's, and it actually feels good and fun and is an engaging, um, exciting thing to be doing with your patient. So hopefully that was helpful to give you guys a little rundown 